Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, we begin part two of our History 102 lecture series with imperialism from 1850 to 1920. Europe takes over the world. So what is imperialism? Well, it's an extension of a nation's military and political control over faraway peoples especially those of different ethnic, religious, and racial heritages, mostly to extract economic resources. Imperialism is not colonialism or colonization, where Europeans or anybody would move to another place. This is the taking over of people, extracting their resources, but very few Europeans will move to any of these places. From 1800 to 1920, Europeans and colonials, their descendants in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, will take over 85% of the world. Very few modern countries were left independent. Thailand, Ethiopia, Japan, China remained a, quote, independent. But even that independence was heavily, heavily influenced by European control, especially economic control. So what happens? What causes it? Well, the first step is actually an internal imperialism. And that's caused by nationalism, the nationalism that was set loose by the French Revolution. So you have an internal imperialism of the land within the boundaries. We see this as a famous book called Turning Peasants into Frenchmen. Uh, Germany does the same thing with, with creating 300 small territories and turning those peoples from Bavarians into Germans. In the United States, you have Manifest Destiny. And unlike the French process, which is violent from time to time, but in the 1800s is less so, it's more of a cultural imperialism, the imposition of a type of French, the imposition of a way of, of laws, of the king's laws. In the United States, it's violence. It's the conquest of the West, the genocide of the Plains Indians, the massacre at Wounded Knee, ending Sioux resistance. For example, not the battle at Wounded Knee, it's the massacre at Wounded Knee. In the United States, they move indigenous First Nations onto, quote, reservations, into land set aside just for the native peoples. That land is usually in the middle of nowhere. And then it got subdivided even more by the Dawes Act of 1897, which said you could have land if you're an indigenous First Nation people. You could have land if you become essentially white, if you become American, quote, unquote. So 90 million acres were stripped from indigenous peoples. And the ent entire goal was to assimilate peoples and destroy their cultures, which was considered good. It was considered nice because the alternative was shooting them and murdering them. So compared to that, they're like, well, at least we're letting them become American. We're making them white instead of being Plains Indians. Canada does much the same. The First Nations must send their children to Catholic training and residential schools from the age of three, where you have huge amounts of sexual and physical abuse, the loss of language, the separation from family. The idea in Canada, and to a lesser extent what happens in the Dawes Act, is to take children out of the culture and basically make them forget what they used to be. You take them out before they can become too much of a Haran or a Sioux or a Blackfoot and just make them into white, whether that's American, Canadian, this, this Christian European. And because these were not citizens, because these were children, because these people were powerless, there's also massive amounts, just massive amounts of sexual and physical abuse. Murder. Nobody's checking in on these people. 
there's the cultural destructions of the First Nations heritage, their family structure, their culture. And in Canada, this continued into the 1970s. In Argentina, you have genocide of the remaining indigenous populations, the seizure of the Pampas in 1870. If you get an Argentine steak, it's probably coming from the Pampas today. This is a great giant flat plateau, the desert, and the purpose of which was to, quote, expel, subjugate, or wipe out the indigenous peoples. They took the uh, Spanish-descended Argentines or European-descended Argentines, took 225,000 square miles of land. As their land was taken, it was resettled by farmers or ranchers, and indigenous peoples were, were worked as domestics, especially women, especially young women, who were then subjugated to prostitution as exotics. Come have sex with an Indian. You've probably never done that before. Two dollars. But the indigenous peoples, despite working as, as domestics, were not allowed into the Anglo-Euro capitalist credit trade system, which meant they couldn't start businesses, they couldn't buy mortgages, they couldn't own houses, they couldn't start farms, and if they could start a farm, they couldn't get credit to buy the machinery to run the farms or the animals. So they were completely locked out of, the, of, of capitalism. So it was, the choice was become white and disappear, assimilate, or stay your home culture and be poor. Be isolated and be poor. So why does imperialism happen? Well, the first is Napoleonic Wars prove Europeans shouldn't fight each other. That when European countries fight each other, you get massive destruction. We'll see this in the American Civil War, right? The conquest of the West really starts up after the American Civil War. You can't, f white people can't fight each other anymore. They've destroyed, the South has been burned down. It has been 2%, uh, 6%, 2%, 2% of Americans died in the Civil War. It's the bloodiest war the United States ever fought. And the idea was, well, you could go west and, and take the land from the Plains Indians. You could take the lands from the natives. And if you shoot them, that's fine. If you ever read um, Cormac McCarthy's book, uh, Blood Meridian, you get just how violent the west is. You know, the wild west. Well, that was the wild west was full of violence. And it was a Hobbesian world of murdering people. Who were less powerful than yourself. So since the Napoleonic proof proved you couldn't build an empire in Europe, the idea was, well, you got to go somewhere else. So where do you go? Well, there's India, there's China, there's Southeast Asia, there's, there's places. And the second thing was, this was a conservatism versus the French Revolution. The French Revolution and the wars of Napoleon unleashed this liberalism throughout Europe. And the idea was, ah, don't let that happen. Now that's going to be a big deal in this part of the course, because as we go through World War One and then World War Two, you're going to see liberalism unleashed again. And so the conservatives of the 1820s, 1830s were right. They're like, we shouldn't fight each other. Otherwise, crazy stuff might happen. And it will. But the idea was, if you destroy, go to the Sudan and kill 10,000 um, Sudanese Muslims and take their land, that's not going to unleash German peasants to overthrow their government. Even if you lose, German peasants aren't going to overthrow their government. So there was a conservatism in Europe to not fight, lest something worse be unleashed. Two. There was Darwin, his ideas of adaption and the survival of the fittest. Now, Darwin is a scientist. He's a moral philosopher. This is one of those things people go, oh, Darwin killed God. Darwin doesn't want to kill God. He doesn't want to kill God at all. But he had a process. 
He saw this process. And he saw that animals were successful if they adapted to their environments. That's what survival of the fittest means. The, not the strongest, not the smartest, but the ones who adapt to the changing environment. Now, Darwin does not talk about people. I mean, he has a book called Origin of the Species, but he never talks about human society. He's not a philosopher. He's not an enlightenment philosopher. He stays in his lane in science, in biology, in evolutionary science. But other people read his stuff and said, well, that applies to people. And that concept became social Darwinism. That the strong should eat the weak. Now, that's not Darwin. Darwin was aghast at that. The fact that Darwinism is, is part of social Darwinism horrified him. Because societies don't work the same way as animals do. Animals eat because they have to eat. Humans don't murder other humans because they have to. They do it because they want to. But what social Darwinism was arguing was the age old idea and saying it's science, it's Darwin that might makes right. And this gets fed into nationalism that our culture, our laws, our language are the best and it must grow or it will die. And our first class, we had quotes that was one of them was the world is divided between living and dying nations that comes from this time. This comes from social Darwinism. It's not Darwin himself who is against all of this, but it's the people who took Darwinist ideas on science and then added it to society to basically justify European racial hegemony hegemony. The idea that those who do not advance fall behind and those who fall those who fall behind go under. It's another quote from this time. So point one is the Europeans don't want to fight each other anymore. They've been doing it essentially since the, well, we've been talking about it. They've essentially been doing it forever, but this slamming away at each other has basically been since the Reformation in 1520. Discovery of the new world. The second was the philosophy of imperialism was Darwin is showing that even though he might be against the idea, he's showing that there is a biological need to conquer other people. The third aspect is they suddenly could industrialization, which we talked about in part one meant you needed massive natural resources, minerals, timber, cloth, in order to produce all the stuff you wanted to make. Plus industrialization allowed for a complete revolution in power by new technologies, new medicines. Europeans could suddenly go into the interior of continents in a way they couldn't before. Steamships allowed French conquerors to go up the Niger River. Merchants could go and do trade a logistics. You could send a British army up the Nile to the Sudan. You didn't need locals anymore. Remember, we talked about the slave trade. The Europeans don't enslave 15 million people. They bought 15 million people. They couldn't go into the interior because there were tropical diseases. They needed to work with local uh, kingdoms, local merchants, local groups as middlemen. Now, the entire industrial process, entire infrastructure will, will be built by European technology, European money, and Europeans at the coast. That's the slave system. But now with industrialization, Europeans could do a heart of darkness. They could sail up the Congo river all the way into the interior of Africa. So people who had never seen a white person ever before suddenly are being met with 
National Geographic, and British Redcoats. Quinine suddenly allowed for anti-malaria, which meant Europeans could survive in the tropics, and in some cases survive better than the locals who didn't have the medicine. And the new weapons of war, repeater rifles, and then later the machine gun, allowed for easy conquests with few losses. The advantages of imperialism. Why would you want to do it? Well, first you get rich. Europe gets rich. Remember when we started this course and Europe was a mess? Well, by 1900, Europe is running the show. Europe is far and away more powerful than the rest of the world. And I'm including Europe as European descendants like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the United States. It allowed for imperialism economically allowed for the predictable supplies of materials which allowed for industrial growth this is the major reason why economically you say it works empire paid for itself you brought in all these new materials so that your industry had enough because if the french took it over they took the mineral wealth if the Germans took it over, they took the mineral wealth, which means you didn't have access to it. There weren't markets. There weren't commodity markets like there are today. So, for example, you see this thinking, you see this thinking uh, in the Middle East with oil. And I saw it with my liberal friends who were like, George Bush is inv invading Iraq in order to take the oil. No, he wasn't. I mean... I was against the Iraq war for a whole host of reasons. I'm a military historian and I knew it was going to be a shit show from the beginning. But oil? Oil is sold on the commodity market to the highest bidder. Most of that oil the United States doesn't get. Most of that oil went to China. So my liberal friends we're wrong on this case because the United States, George Bush invaded Iraq for China to get the oil. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So it wasn't about the oil. If we wanted the oil, you just leave it to be sold in New York and Chicago or London or Amsterdam on the markets, on the exchange markets. But that system didn't work, didn't exist yet in 1890. So you, you had to physically own the land to own the minerals. So that idea that you're conquering a place for the oil is a 19th century idea. It's a mercantilist idea. We'll talk about mercantilism a little bit later. Conquering a place also allowed for a new market to sell goods to because now you locked out. If you're the British, you lock out the French and the Germans. If you're the Germans, you lock out the British and the French. You suddenly had people, you had a monopoly on selling goods to people, which is good for your industry and good for your workers because now they'll sell more goods, even though most of the people of the, of the non-European world are going to be poor. Uh, they still want good things. And remember, good things get cheaper with industrialization. And so that adds to more wealth. So now, not only are you extracting from your empire the mineral wealth, you're also extracting from it literal wealth. So the people who are working for you in the mines to pull out the minerals are then paying you to buy goods you're selling them to. And they don't have an option. They have to buy British goods in the British Empire. And fourth, we get the spread of culture, language, religion, time. Notice what year it is, right? It's 2021, which is what? It's 2021 years since the birth of Jesus. Why does the world care about a Jewish son of a carpenter, of a furniture maker? Why? Because Europeans went around the world and with guns told people it's 1852. 
And people went, no, it's not. It's an eight pointed the guns at people and said, it's 1852. I went, okay, okay. All of this reinforced cultural superiority and racism. One of the crazier things I have with telling my students is that slavery in much of the world ends in the 1830s. It ends in the United States in 1860. It ends in Brazil in 1888, right? But the world, the European world in 1900, is way more racist in 1900 than it is in 1800. It's more scientifically racist. It's more cultural superiority. It's more nationalism. It is more, it's more racist in 1900 than it was. It justifies its racism much harder in 1900. Like, you don't get apartheid in 1804. You have it in 1904. And so the people who are writing this nationalistic white supremacy stuff that's coming out are, are, they're, they're just far more racist. And you may go, well, that's crazy. But see, with slavery, it's easy. You're a slave. Of course, you're inferior. I have enslaved you. I have bought you. But there is also the paternalism. I'll make you better. Well, without slavery, it's just you people suck and I'm awesome. Right? You don't even have the economic connection anymore, much less the, 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 the proximity connection. And so just racism gets worse which is a crazier thing. Crimes. Well, we were talking about racism getting worse. We have, we have racism with social Darwinism. We have scientific natural racism. White people are better. Now, there's also going to be debates over which white people are the best white people. And the answer, for the craziest of reasons, are people from the Caucasus region of Russia, which is why white people are called Caucasian. Now, you may go, why, Professor? Why are white people called Caucasian? And all I can tell you, without getting into this, is just understand this. In 1905, when it comes to racism, white people be crazy. Because I could tell you, I could take an hour and go through all the scientific understandings of ratings and ratios and classical knowledge and all of this stuff. And you'll go, that's crazy. And I'll say, yes. So let's just skip all of that and just say when it comes to racism and 1905, Europeans, white people, are just crazy. So we see this with apartheid in South Africa. We'll see this later with European fascism in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. We see the stealing, the looting, the raping, the pillaging of a natural world that Europeans did not own and of their non-European peoples. The most famous of this destruction is in the Belgian Congo, of which there is a image, which is a massive human rights atrocity in order to get rubber, rubber for industry, rubber for rubber bands and industrial bands for belts. They, the Belgians cut off the hands if people were not working fast enough. And I shouldn't say it's old Belgians. It's technically King Leopold's private domain. He technically owned, not him as a state, him as a private citizen, owned the Belgian Congo, which tells you just how effed up white people were. He said, oh, look, that middle part of Africa, it's mine now. And the rest of Europe went, okay. So he hired companies, he empowered companies. This is one place where the heart of darkness, Joseph Conrad's book comes in. And you have just savagery. 
Just absolute savagery. The third crime is one we're still living in with today, and that's the breakup of the nat natural internal trade connection connections. The Europeans are going to smush people together who were not normally together, and it's going to break people apart who are supposed to be in who are supposed to be together. And it's going to empower minorities using violence. The Europeans are going to give guns to oppressed peoples and say, with those guns, help us oppress the majorities. Territories got poorer, more socially divided, and tied economically and politically to Europe, not to their local regions. So the wealth of Africa, especially, but also in India and also in China, is being flowing from the interior to the ports, from the ports to Europe. So all trade is going through Europe. And it's just a giant vacuum sucking this stuff out. All right, so now let's talk about some specifics, some events. India, the Indian subcontinent. In the 1700s, the British and the French start to fight over who controls the access points of India, the major, the major ports. The British East India Company dominates trade with India and replaces the Mughal Empire with local alliances. This is known as the Raj, the British Raj. In exchange, the British East India Company, a private company, is able to basically get a monopoly on tea, tea silk, cotton, opium, and other luxury consumables. And it's that that they send all over the world. Remember, the, in Boston, you have a Boston Tea Party. What tea did they throw into the sea? British East India Company Indian Tea. This tea. And so what, through these series of local alliances, the British East India Company, by arming some groups and conquering other groups and empowering some groups and destroying others, is recreating, is, is reshuffling the power dynamics of India. And you can see it in the map. We have a smaller Mughal Empire nowhere near the sea. We got the Maratha Empire that in 1735 has yet to really come into conflict with the British and the French. And you get the British and the French all over these little ports, especially in the south, and the Brits up in Bengal. Compare that to 1900, where all that, all those like thousand little countries are smushed together with Myanmar, Burma into the British Raj, R-A-J. And that smushing happens after 1856 in what, what is called the Sepoy Mutiny. The British East India Company hired Hindus and Muslims as auxiliary troops. Their best troops were European, but there weren't enough, so you always had to hire local troops, and you paid better than the local kings, and boom, they would work for you. Well, in 1856, those Sepoys, those mercenaries working for the British East India Company, revolted. They tried to kick out the Europeans. Both the Hindus and the Muslim soldiers revolted. It failed. The mutiny failed. The Brits would come back. They would take over. And they and what the decision was made was that India was worth too much money to let go. And so they dissolved the British East India Company and Britain decided to run India as a colony. It's going to put in an administrative and investment infrastructure. It is going to bring in governors. It is going to bring in bureaucrats. It is going to bring in tax collectors. It is going to run India in order to make money for the British government. It's also going to be under military occupation. Many of the famous generals that you're going to talk about in British history from this point on, or even from the 1700s on, end up in India either before or after their exploits. Cornwallis goes, after losing in America, goes to India and conquers much of India. Wellington, before he goes and fights Napoleon, will, will learn how to make war in India. 
So India is going to be the Indian subcontinent is going to be under a British military occupation. And their justification for all this was the education of locals to help run India for Britain, what they called our Brown brothers. See, unlike in many of these colonies that we're going to talk about, where Europeans did nothing to, to create anything that might in the future be independent. In India, they did. And the reason why is India was too big, too old, too diverse, too culturally broken apart, too geographically huge to not hire Indians to help. And so from the very beginning, the British uh, from 1856 on are going to hire Indians to help them run India. This is Gandhi, for example. Gandhi is trained as a British lawyer. What this allows for is the spread of opium, because everyone likes drugs, but linen and English, the English language, and cricket, and to Britain, curry. British food gets much more flavorful. But South Asia loses control of its culture, and its economy. It doesn't control its culture or its economy for the first time ever, ever. Remember, we talked about the Delhi Sultanate, you know, India has to be run from India. Now it's not. Queen Victoria becomes Empress of India. She's 8,000 miles away. What about um, Qing China? Well, the Qing were Manchus. They were northern nomads. They're not tied to the sea. They're from the mountainous hill country to the north of, of uh, the Chinese Han um, home provinces. But the, and they have problems. They got the Ming in Taiwan. They got Japanese pirates and they got these annoying Europeans who keep showing up. And so what their answer was, was to close off the ports. We've kind of talked about this back. The Ming will try to do this as well. So we've already kind of talked about this and move people away from the coast. Like you don't have to spend all the money to defend people if they're not there. This may sound kind of crazy, but the Europe, Europeans did the same thing against the Vikings. It's just that the Vikings went upriver. But the idea was you kind of depopulate. That's how the Vikings end up settling in Normandy. Like the people who had been in Normandy, a lot of them left to avoid getting beaten up and attacked by Vikings and enslaved by Vikings. So they moved into the interior of France. And so the French king goes, hey, 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 you see this territory that has nobody in it? You, you own that now. You defend it, Vikings. You defend it. And the Vikings went, okay. The only places where you were allowed, Europeans were allowed to trade, were Macau and Guangzhou, known in my lifetime as Canton. But mostly, the Qing don't need anything from the Europeans. They mostly just import silver, which is going to be a big problem, and we're going to see why. But for 300 years, it hadn't been a problem. Silver was exported by the Spanish to the Philippines, from the Philippines to the Qing, to the Ming and then the Qing, and it was f fine. But with the revolutions in the 1820s, the Spanish lost control over the silver mines of America, and so that dried up. And so they turned to the British, the Portuguese, the French, and said, okay, now you're going to give us silver, right? And we'll give you stuff. And the Europeans were not so happy about that idea. We'll talk about why. So the problem for Qing China is it has a huge market to sell to. It's got, you know, now it has 1.5 billion people. And this is the same problem you have today. All of these countries, all of these companies and countries want to sell to the Chinese market. 
They want access. Well, the Qing don't want them to have access. Now you have to bring in economic philosophy. European economics was based on a concept called mercantilism. And the idea of mercantilism was you had to sell more than buy to get rich. That it was a, a, an exchange of limited goods. So I bought tea from you for $10, meant I am now $10 poorer. Now, I now have tea. I could sell that tea. I could drink that tea. I could enjoy that tea. I could do lots of things with that tea. But the way mercantilism looked at it was you got poor because you gave money for a thing. And so mercantilism, even though it's pre-Darwin, is kind of an economic Darwinism. One party has to lose. And it's the idea that there's a limited amount of money in circulation. And this is not a, an idea that's, that's, it's dead in economics, but it's not an idea that's dead in people's heads because it kind of makes sense. If I pay you, I'm $10 poorer and Wawa is $10 richer, right? And we saw this with President Trump. We see this with the news. Like President Trump had all of our trade deals suck. We are always losing. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. It's much more complicated than that. But that's the mercantilist way of thinking about it. And that's where most people think about it, because you have the news, the mainstream media, quote unquote, which when I was a kid was obsessed with the trade deficit. Oh, my God. The trade deficit with Japan is now $100 billion, which meant we were sending $100 billion to Japan. Japan was $100 billion wealthier. And all I got for it was a Toyota Corolla. Well, yeah, but that Toyota Corolla now allows me to drive from the suburbs to the city to do work and then drive back. In the city, I make more money than I would in the suburbs, but the house I have in the suburbs is worth more money than I would be in 1983 New York. And so, but none of that is figured in to mercantilism or to lots of elementary school way of thinking. They said, you're handing over money in exchange for a good, one side is winning, one side is losing. It's when it's your boss. If you've ever worked for a, a smaller than huge company, especially private, private bosses, every time you ask for a raise, oh, well, I don't, I, why? Because they have to give you that 25 cents an hour. I dealt with this when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. And you would think they were like killing their children to give you a dime more an hour because that's how they felt about it. Cause they were getting poor. They said, Oh, every, every penny I give you, I'm a penny poor. That's not my penny. Now, modern economics would say, well, you're paying to keep that employee because if that employee leaves, then you have to get a new employee. You have to train that new employee. That new employee has to be then as good as the ex-employee, and that takes time and money. So it probably costs you more than the quarter, 25 cents an hour to replace that new person, that person with somebody new. But that's not how people think. People go, I'm giving over that penny, that dime, I got raised for a dime once. Unbelievable. But they will fight you as if you, you're trying to kill their children. So it's not mercantilism as an idea, as a way of, as a philosophy in people's heads of how economics works isn't dead. Now it doesn't work on the, on the global scale. Apple. Amazon do not think in mercantilist terms at all. And that's why they're big and rich. And your boss is trying to screw you for 25 cents. This problem that the Europeans needed to sell stuff to China and the Chinese didn't want to buy European stuff causes the opium wars where the British are drug pushers. The British empire was a drug gang. 
was a narco was a narco state. We could talk about it with with all the culture of Dickens and um, Jane Austen and in the 1830s they were a narco drug gang and they fought a series of wars forcing China to open up trade and allow especially for the sale of opium to their population. This is the start of what's called the unfair treaties, which are seen as a humiliation. Take a look if you're watching the video of the cartoon of the time. Look how just racist this is, right? You got the the Europeans, right? Queen Victoria. Um, I want to say that's Bismarck. I guess it could be Wilhelm or Wilhelm's father. Uh, you got Alexander. Right, you got a woman representing the French. Remember liberty. Then you've got the two Japan who gets to sit at the big boy table and is mulling it over. But notice how he's drawn, both in the the knot, the hair knot, the clothing, the skin color, and then look at the caricature of the Mandarin um, Qing diplomat throwing up his arm, his hands with the with the uncut un un. Un, uh, unadorned nails that are like, I mean, just the, 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 the hair, uh, it's just, holy shnikes. And this is a humiliation if you're the China, if you're the Qing China, you were the biggest empire in the world when you took over in 1644. And now you're having a little European drug pushers push you around. But this also opened up, hey, if the British got an unfair treaty, the British get a treaty with China, I get I get one too. I get one too. And they start dividing up China. The Europeans start doing to China what they are going to do to Africa and what they were unable to do to India because the British took it all. And then the U.S. steps in. The United States steps in and the U.S. wants trade. And it doesn't want a war in the colonies. It doesn't want to have to send a giant navy. It doesn't want all of the stuff. And nobody wants a Napoleonic war to start over China, of all things. And so the answer was the open door policy. Europeans are happily in charge and they could sell their goods anywhere, which is good for the British and good for the Americans because they made the most goods at the cheapest prices. But the idea was instead of dividing up China into small local colonies, like what will happen to, to Africa, it was left as the idea was it was easier to make money off of China if you kept it whole. It, there was enough China for everybody was was basically the idea. And since the United States was a big industrial power and nobody wanted to fight over China because of the Napoleonic Wars. They let it go. So this is the first scene. The, the open door policy is the first place where we see the United States kind of throwing its weight around in the world and getting its way. The Europeans go, okay, we'll do it. What this does is increases trade with China. British goods, European goods start flooding into China. The emperor is allowed to charge a sales tax, which you may go, well, the Europeans would be upset about that. But no, they're like, you are, of course, allowed to charge a sales tax. Sales tax is the oldest tax in existence. You're allowed to charge a sales tax on all of the new goods being sold. And so the Chinese emperor gets rich. For the first time since Qinglong, the Chinese emperor is rich again, has control over a lot of money. And suddenly the Chinese emperor is becoming an ally of the Europeans. He's been bought off. Yes, it's opium for his people. Yes, he's getting his, he's selling drugs to his people. Uh, but he's making good money. And so to dislike, and this is the problem of the legitimacy. To dislike the Europeans, you have to dislike the emperor. Because the emperor is gaining from his relationship with the Europeans. The emperor has been bought off. And no emperor can turn off this spigot. It's too hard. One, you don't have the military force to do it. 
You can't suddenly close off the ports, blow up British ships, and, and shut down. You can't. The second is the money's too good. So, so the, there's a point where the British actually collect the money for the emperor in the ports. And they are more honest than the mandarins are. Because the mandarins would skim off the top. Because they hadn't gotten a raise in a hundred years. And so it wasn't like, it wasn't corruption. Because it was understood, you'll, you'll put aside a little bit for your, take care of yourself. Right? You'll put aside 10%. But the British were paid a salary, a regular salary. And so when the British took over the sales tax and collecting of the customs taxes, the emperor actually made more money. The British were honest about it. It's the craziest thing I've read about this. And you go, wait, 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 why? But they were. And we get two major rebellions. One is a civil war. They're called rebellions. But one is a major civil war. The Taiping Rebellion goes on for 20 years. And it kills 30 million people trying to overthrow the emperor and then kick out the Europeans. Plus, then in 1900, there's the Boxer Rebellion, which tries to do the same thing, except the Taiping Rebellion tried to throw, overthrow the emperor and then kick out the Europeans. The Boxer Rebellion tried to kick out the Europeans and then throw out the emperor. But both of them set up the same problem. A foreign Manchu Qing emperor with European allies were working against Han Chinese. That the, the emperor was not Chinese, he wasn't Han, and he was working with the foreigners to exploit us. And that came to a head in 1911 when Chinese reformers overthrew the Qing emperor and formed the republic, overthrowing a 5,000-year-old form of government. What about Africa? Well, in 1807, 1808, you have the end of the slave trade. And from 1815 to 1865, it's official British naval policy to stop slave ships going to the Western Hemisphere. And yet, in this period, from 1807 to 1865, 25% of all slaves were transported to the New World. So you could see just how industrialization was increasing just as they uh, just as the slave trade was coming to an end it was ramping up at the same time everyone trying to get in their last slave orders before the british finally stopped the spigot in the 1880s leopold of belgium king leopold of belgium conquered the congo as his own private territory and this sets up a humanitarian disaster as we talked about, the cutting off of arms, the cutting off, the torturing of people. And this created the 1885 Berlin Conference, where Europeans got together and said, well, this is messed up. We got to do something about this. And they created rules, quote unquote, but rules. Remember, no one wants a Napoleonic War again. So they created rules for how they would divide up Africa. The idea was the continent had this massive amount of wealth, especially in rubber, but also in its traditional export of mining, gold, silver, um, copper, iron. And so the Europeans didn't want to f start a war in Europe over Africa any more than they wanted to start one in Europe over China. And so they set up these rules. And so what happens is the Europeans invade the coasts and start going up the rivers. France will end up in Algeria. Now, they'll turn Algeria into a part of France. To like it's, it's to France what Alaska or Hawaii is to America. And two or three million Frenchmen will move to Algeria. Albert Camus will write a series of novels about the, uh, the French in Algeria. They'll set up in Algeria, in Tunis, and they'll go up the river to, of the Niger River. They'll go up the Niger River and conquer the Sahel kings. That's in Mali, the modern country of Mali. Um, and the kingdoms of West Africa that we talked about in History 101. The English will take Egypt and go up the Nile. They'll take over the Suez Canal that was originally built by Egyptians with French help. They take over the Nile 
They colonize southern Africa, so they're pushing south from the north and pushing north from the south. They'll meet in Kenya, in the highlands of Kenya, uh, where the European, where you have a European climate. South Africa and Kenya, the highlands of Kenya, have European climates and will see the highest level of British colonization, where it's not just imperialism, it's also colonization. The Portuguese were already in Angola on the Atlantic coast and Mozambique on the Indian Ocean. And by the end of the 1880s, only Ethiopia remained independent because it had been Christian. Because it was Orthodox Christian and the Europeans respected, they made up the reason, well, we've come to bring you Christianity. And the Ethiopia is like, we're already Christian. Well, we've come to bring you the Bible. We we got one. Thank you. Well, we guess you're going to stay independent then. I can't. We don't really have a good reason to conquer you. Well, thanks. Thank thank you, Europeans. And so, if you're watching the video, you can see what happens, right? In 1775, most of Africa is still African kingdoms. There's a little bit of Portugal in Angola. There's a little bit of French on the coast there, right? The Ottomans dominate North North uh, Africa, right? You get a lot of local African kingdoms. In 1884, that's the one to the, in the top right, you still have mostly um, African kingdoms, but Mozambique now exists. Cape Colony in South Africa, which is first Dutch and then it's British. You have the British moving south down uh, up the Nile. That's the Egypt and then the Sudan. And then you have 1901. In 15 years, just all of Africa is just divided up. With only one place really left, and that's Abyssinia. That's, e that's Ethiopia. But everywhere else is owned by somebody from Europe. So it's just this, what's called the scramble for Africa. And that's essentially what it was is 15 years of just looting who gets what. This isn't done easily. There is resistance there are in India, in China, in Africa, there is a resistance to the Europeans coming in and taking over. And so you get war. That's the most ordinary form of resistance. And that was defeat. For most Africans, it's defeat. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the logistics. They didn't have the ability to fight. Kiss Kissinger's army in the Sudan in 1898 was better fed than the Sudanese army that were local to the area. And that and Kissinger had to bring in um, all of that food from Britain. That's what the Brit that's what industrialization allowed European armies to do. And so you had defeat. And there were local groups always willing to work with Europeans. The Europeans weren't dumb. They went in, then they exploited age-old hatreds and age-old wars and conflicts that have been going on forever. Local, local tribes did not work together. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the Europeans were willing to divide and conquer. And they were willing to arm and privilege minorities. Because in an age where, where you didn't have, where you now have machines and the machine gun, a small number of people could outgun, could defeat a large number of people. Traditionally, if you use swords, spears, you know, handheld weapons, the bigger group always, almost always wins. Well, suddenly the Europeans are arming. And we're going to see this when we get to decolonization and the wars of decolonization. I mean, you've seen the Syrian civil war of the last 10 years. That is a minority that was armed originally by the French trying to hold on to power against the Sunni Arab majority. You saw the civil war in Iraq, 2005, six, seven. Maybe you fought in the civil war in Iraq. You're seeing it in Afghanistan now. All of these have the similar thing that in 1900, the Europeans went to these places and gave guns 
to the minority groups, minority ethnic groups who had been oppressed. And the exchange was, we'll give you guns, but you're going to help us run the show. And these minority groups said, yeah, we like that idea. That's a good deal for us. Even when you had African victories at Khartoum in 1885 or in South Africa, uh, South Africa with the Zulus, it is, is on Alana, is on the Luana in 1879, the Europeans just returned with a bigger army and bigger guns. So Khartoum gave us the Battle of uh, Omdurman in Sudan in 1898, where the Europeans killed 12,000 um, Muslim warriors, wounded 13,000, captured 5,000. So that's 30,000. That's an entire army. 30,000 casualties versus 400 English killed or wounded. 400, not 4,000, not 40,000, 400. And this is just shows the just clear superiority of industrialized warfare against non-industrialized warfare. African labor was used, wages were paid, that created a generational conflict and created European allies. Young men were willing to work with the Europeans because the Europeans paid them money. And it allowed them to then get wives in a, in a polygamous society where old men own the money. So suddenly they income the British going, Hey, young guys, young man, how do you want to work for me? We'll pay you. We'll pay you to mine. We'll pay you to cart. We'll pay you to do all this thing. And we'll pay in gold. We'll pay in money. And so it allowed young men to break away from the generational conflict that had been going on for five, six hundred years in Afri in African tribal society, where old men dominated the wealth. So what this did was tie to African to the European economic system for the first time since Rome. But you also got apartheid. You got racism. You got Southern Africa and the United States. The idea of the separation of white owners from non-white workers. It created caste societies, right? Black people could not be white. They could not have the rights of white people. But they created those caste societies in democratic enlightenment cultures. All men are created equal. And so you get this idea that rights and humanity are color dependent. We still see this with the Black Lives Matter, right? The idea that Black Lives Matter, that, 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 it's, that our rights and our humanity are not color dependent. Well, that starts here. And they use science to help enforce that. Like apartheid, like measured the width of noses to see how black you were, how African you were. You know, there's the one drop, quote unquote, rule in America that if you have any black ancestors, you're black and you get no rights. You get, you know, so you had to completely pass as white. Other white people had to accept you as white for you to be white. And they used violence to enforce it. Murder, lynchings, the law, executions. And you get American ghettos in the north, you get Jim Crow in the south, but you get the um, townships in South Africa that are just congregations of these people set away from wealthier white society. What about Japan? Japan is our one exception to all of this. In the 1500s, Japan was closed to trade. In the 1850s, the USA showed up and said, you have to trade with us or something bad's going to happen. And the Japanese were scared. They were scared of becoming like Qing China. And so what you got was a revolution. You got the liberals winning the Meiji Restoration. The emperor plus the liberals overthrew the conservative Tokugawa government. And what they started was a crash course in industrialization of becoming European. Copy, copy, copy. Now, when I was a kid, there was a, it was, it was considered, it was a racial um, insult 
the Japanese can't invent anything. They're really good at copying. That racist idea starts here when they did copy because they had to catch up. So their army was based on the German army. Their Navy was based on the British Navy and the British will actually build boats for the for the Japanese Navy. Factories were American factories. Education was British and American. But not religion. Of all the things, it was not religion. Zen Buddhist and the emperor remained. They didn't take on Christianity. But to do this industrialization, you needed resources for industry. Japan is a bunch of islands, volcanic islands in the middle of the Pacific, down in the middle of the Pacific, on the edge of the Asian uh, continent, and has nothing, has no coal, has no major mineral resources. And so they needed resources. So that meant war with China in 1898, which got them access, which got them control of Korea, which gave them access to Manchuria. That meant imperialism, but also cultural genocide against Koreans. Very quickly, the Japanese used Korean women as sex slaves. They outlawed the Korean language and writing system. In 1905, they went to war with Russia to become the dominant um, power in the North Pacific, and they win. They are the first European they win the first no European naval war. It's the first European naval defeat in 400 years. Russia's humiliated. And one of the reasons that's going to get us to World War I, because one of the things the Russian emperor wanted to do was to win a war against Germany to make up for the fact that he lost the war against the Japanese, which is very insulting because the Japanese are not Europeans. What this made, what industrialization made, what imperialism made, what defeating the Russians made was Japan, the smallest of the big boys. They got to sit at the big boys table. They were included. They weren't respected, but they were included. They are the only non-European country to industrialize. And they're looking for respect. They're part of the big boys club. And because of European racism, they're not really in it. And that's going to be a big deal in World War I and especially World War II. But what Japan also showed is you needed an empire to join the big boys club. Something Germany doesn't have. Something Italy doesn't have. And that's going to get us into World War One. So we did a lot of violence. We did a lot of conquest. We did a lot of cultural imperialism. Thank you for going through it with me. Take care. Be safe.